morning and good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Atkins. I'm the general manager of the Thermbond Refractory Group within Unifrax. And we're here today uh, to share with you some information about Thermbond and HPI market, as well as uh, the APAI 936 standards. Presenting today is going to be Mr. Ted Hagberg. Uh, Ted was the uh, uh, vice president of business development for Thermbond Refractory Group. And now with Unifrax, he's the global uh, marketing manager for HPI. And Ted will be presenting today. Please refrain uh, from asking questions during the presentation, but Ted will be stopping intermittently to uh, uh, ask if you have any questions. So just unmute yourself and ask your question. So thank you, Ted. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, this is pretty exciting, quite honestly, because this presentation is something that I would typically uh, present at a workshop, which uh, we've participated in, well, I think since 2007, where we've had multiple workshops over many years. So being able to do this virtually uh, with the same opportunity to share information on how Thermbond has been embraced uh, worldwide in the refining petrochem industry, and, and then also discuss the importance of the uh, API standard 936, allow questions to be asked. I think this is a great opportunity for all of us. So I'm excited about being able to do this. We'll go Tom. There we go. We're gonna, we, may, we, may, we may go one, one ahead, it was a little slow. Yeah, well, we're gonna focus on three main topics. Uh, as they're written there on the screen. We're gonna address technology, what Thermbond is all about, how it differentiates. Uh, we're also gonna address uh, the importance of the API, the acceptance of the product in the marketplace. So those are the three topics that we're gonna focus Thank on. Thank you. What we'd like to do initially is just provide an overview of what makes Thermbond uh, unique uh, compared to conventional refractory materials, which are basically monolithic materials uh, utilizing uh, water as the liquid and reacting with cement. The Thermbond is a different technology. Too bad there's a delay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. This is not going well. No, this is where we need Michael Forrest. Yeah, seems like a very long delay. There we go. Beautiful. Okay, well, so we have a family of uh, materials. They're all two component phosphate bonded products. And the family are listed on the screen. I really don't need to go into the details of them at this time. I'll discuss it a little bit deeper later. But as you can see, we have a number of different types of formulations, uh, but they all utilize the unique liquid phosphate binder system, which is what makes technology of Thermbond unique. Next, what do we focus on? We focus on time, the value of time. So being able to cure refractory quicker, which in, with Thermbond, it's basically one to three hours versus the conventional materials that take up to 24 hours. The rapid startup, which is so important when you're allowed, when the operators are allowed to turn their unit on, start the burners. We can save many days depending upon the design. This is just a schematic showing the difference in an eight inch or 205 millimeter lining thickness. And in this case here, we're saving 
over one and a half days on your startup procedure. But in many cases, we're saving more than that depending upon aligning design. This is just a comparison. I'm switching. Yeah, this delay is difficult, Tom. I know. As slow yeah. as we are. I know. And I've been doing this a long time. Come on, baby. Oh. I'm not sure why it's not switching. You see that? So I'm seeing a screen. Um, which is really the reason why Thermbond technology with the liquid component of phosphate uh, can rapidly start up the unit and the reason why it does not require the lengthy hold times like the cement bonded water-based products. And it's all related to the steam pressure. And the liquid phosphate has between 20 to 60% lower steam pressure than when you're converting water to steam. And that's why you're able to start up your unit if you have Thermbond installed in your unit much faster. Uh, it's related to pressure that comes from the liquid uh, being removed during the startup and increasing of temperatures. So that's the big aspect of being able to save time. I think Tom's trying to figure out a way to move these uh, pictures quicker, which is great uh, if we're able to do that. Did we switch? I see now yes. I have, yeah, the pictures are on the left, each individual yeah. slide, yeah. which may, will make it easier to move, hopefully. So the next facet of the technology is the ability to withstand thermal shock. The liquid phosphate, the bonding system, uh, it's, it's like a ring and a chain structure, which is very similar to organic polymers, which allows the stress strain ratio to be very low. And that's referred to as modulus of elasticity, or in this case, it's called the low V modulus. But basically what it means is that you can put a lot of strain through thermal stress on your refractory lining without it cracking because conventional materials become very brittle after they see heat. So they may be very strong, but they don't have the ability to handle the stress because they are so rigid and therefore they crack. Whereas Thermbond has a more flexible structure due to its low modulus, uh, V modulus, and therefore it can take the stress strain much greater without cracking. It's one of the features of the technology. Chemical bonding is certainly something that Thermbond is very known for. As it initially started out as a technology for repairs, it has certainly grown into full lining thicknesses over the years. But one of the certainly advantages is when you're doing a repair, the liquid phosphate of the Thermbond literally reacts chemically with the earth alkalis of the existing fired refractory. So those earth alkalis could be calcium, could be magnesium, depending upon what the material is that we're bonding to. But it's phosphate from the therm bond material that reacts chemically with those earth alkalis. And that's what forms that strong chemical bond, not just a mechanical bond. Uh, excellent okay. for repairs. We've analyzed this, we've tested this multiple times with different products. I'm just going to present to you a, an overview of a test that we were asked to provide by a client where we were testing a very high density material that you may, many of you may be familiar with. 
called, a, it's a Resco product called AA22. And we cast these bars, fired them, broke them in half, and then installed Thermbond, our Formula 12 high erosion material, uh, and then refired them to exhibit and determine the bond strength. So you'll see the next picture here. This is the type of modulus of rupture equipment that we used oh. to put stress on the bar to determine the weakest point of the material now that it's a, a, a composite bonded block. And you'll see the result in the next slide where the material broke and cracked oh. at the weaker of the two materials, not at the bond plane. So we're not stating here that whether it's AA22 or Formula 12L, one product is better than another. What we're stating and showing and exhibiting is that the bond strength is stronger than the weaker of the two products. And this type of testing, we have a lot of documentation. So if any of you have any questions related to how this was done, we have supporting documents that show the testing that we've completed on multiple products, but we don't have the time to go into all the details of the test results. So I've tried to simplify the value of this uh, and how the bond strength is uh, what is the most important feature as it relates to this aspect of our technology. But if there's any of you that have any questions now regarding what we've presented up to this point regarding our technology, and I do apologize for the initial confusion and in getting this moving and kind of, it, it's going a little bit uh, smoother now. But if you have any questions, I think Tom will open up uh, and allow any of you to ask the question. Uh, right now, everybody should, is probably off mute, is unmuted. So if you have a question, anybody, um, please unmute yourself and uh, ask. Hi, Ted. Uh, this is Arindam. Yes. Uh, in slide number eight, uh, it is shown the, the uh, stress strain graph of two, two different items. Uh, which is thumb one? Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is actually showing a couple of different things, this particular uh, schematic here. And it's, it's showing obviously like just a view of a burner tile, but it's trying to show where the actual stress strain is as it's located within the tile when they fire the tile. So most people would think that the most strain and stress is going to be on the hot face of the burner tile. But in actuality, the stress strain is much more severe internal, which is on the right-hand side of the schematic where the strain is most evident, where you see the red color. So those two um, particular uh, schematics they're showing is just trying to show you where the strain is actually located within the tile as it's going through its firing. Oh, thanks. That answered my question. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, if you could all uh, mute yourselves, that would be very much appreciated and Ted will continue. Yeah, the next, uh, th this actually shows the results. Um, because again, this was one that I wasn't going to go into in detail because it could take a little time to share, but these were the actual test results from that bonding uh, that we did. And it shows where we did the modulus of rupture testing of three different materials with three point modulus of rupture testing. And then we show the four point testing on the bond between the Formula 12W therm bond as well as the Formula 12L therm bond bonded to the AA. So what you see is that the bond strength is very, very good. And the actual breakage point was within the refractory, not at the bond. And this is just a one screen picture where we have all the documentation from all the testing that we've done. But um, 
It's just trying to give you an overview of showing strength of the bond relative to the bonding when you're doing a repair. Uh, can I remind everybody to please mute yourselves? Thank you. Now we're going to go into the actual products themselves and how they've been embraced worldwide in the refining petrochem industry. I just want to briefly share the fact that we have a very comprehensive product mix. Uh, we showed some pictures of the different bags and jugs earlier, but uh, what we have is a family of different materials with over 100 formulations. We have from lightweight insulating materials, which we refer to as therm break. And then we have a, a line of medium weight insulating materials called heat break. Our, our flagship product mix is called the formula series, which is high density materials. Uh, and then for extreme erosion, which is where we use the material in, as an example, high erosion cyclones and cat crackers, uh, we use our Formula 12 series. And then last but not least is concrete, concrete applications where we do a lot of repairs where we're bonding and, and fixing uh, in civil as well as in applications such as sulfur pits. The versatility of the products, we have a full line from vibe cast to gunning to ramming as well as troweling. So we just have a full family of materials within each of the product mix. I think one of the things that's established Thermbond on a global level has been over many, many years working with the original equipment manufacturers on getting Thermbond approved on their standards. So they have, these companies listed here have specifications and there's multiple other OEMs that we've worked with. These are just some of the highlighted accounts that we've established the acceptance of Thermbond on their specifications. And I'll just name them because I'm not sure how familiar you all are with them, but UOP is Universal Oil Products. Uh, Technip S&W is actually Technip Stone and Webster, which you may be familiar with the name Stone and Webster. They've merged with Technip. Uh, McDermott really uh, recently going through a change as well, but they acquired the CB&I Loomis cat cracker technology. KBR is Kellogg, Brown and Root, worldwide known. And John Zink Hamworthy is a, a, one of the largest, if not the largest, and probably are the largest, uh, burner and thermal oxidizer uh, design OEM in the world. All of those companies have embraced Thermbot. We've proven ourselves, uh, not just with end users, uh, but we have over 20 years of experience. Uh, the reason why we've continued to grow in all of these applications is because of the reliability of the technology and the value that we've provided. So over a period of time, we now have refractory contractors uh, worldwide that are very experienced installing all of our different materials and different refining petrochem applications. We work closely with the engineering firms as well as fabricators that fabricate not only the heaters and the furnaces, but the pressure vessels as well. And so we've worked with all of these organizations worldwide. We continue to grow uh, and it's all based on the reliability and the value that Thermbond provides to the client which is the end user. Are there any, uh, any questions in regards to uh, the issues I just addressed related to acceptance, application, or not the applications, but the acceptance and uh, the work that we've done in establishing the credibility of the product worldwide? Yes, uh, my name's Adrian. Awesome. I have a question on your slide 15. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at your extreme erosion product and you're recommending the 12, 12L. We utilize a 6L in an erosive atmosphere and I'm just wondering if you can tell me the difference between 12L and 6L. Sure, that's, that's, a, that's a great <laughs> question. If you don't mind me asking, what is the application? 
it's a transfer line exchange or inlet. Okay, great question. Uh, in the yeah, it's it's a very good question. And, and Adrian, what I would say is formula 12L has an abrasion resistance or an abrasion loss value per the ASTM test method, which is called C704, of less than three CC loss. So we're talking extreme erosion resistance. In many of these transfer line applications, what you want is a robust product that has reasonable abrasion resistance. I mean, it's a dense material of like formula 6L is around 150 pounds per cubic foot with an erosion loss of let's say 18 cc loss. Formula 12L is much denser, 180 pounds with an, with an erosion loss of less than wow. three. So, so it's all a matter of requirement, uh, thermal properties, uh, what's the application. So what one person may refer to as erosion, an erosion environment, another person may not consider it to be severe enough to even look upon a Formula 12 type product. I hope that helps explain it. Okay, thanks. And just one quick follow-up. Uh, as far as shock resistance, which would be more stable, the 6L or 12L? Well, that's, a, that's another very good question. Uh, because most of the time, the Formula 12L type products are only installed one inch thick. There are applications where it might be up to two inches thick, but they're usually only thin linings because that's where the real abrasion concerns are located. And thermal shock is not what it's being targeted for. So the Formula 6L is gonna be better suited for thermal shock requirements because typically it's installed thicker, like four or five, six inches thick. So yeah. both materials offer good thermal shock resistance, but the 6L series is better suited in a thermal shock application. It's a mullite based, it's not a high aluminum material, so it's much more able to give, it has a, a much more resilience to thermal stress than what you would consider for the 12L. Hi, Adrian. It's uh, Adrian. It's James Smith here. Uh, it's been a few years since we've talked. Um, the 6L that you're using in your, your cones there as well is, is something that can be cast in for that application. You know, the 12L is a hand pack ram kind of material uh, for, for thinner lines. And with this cyclical uh, action that you have going on in those cones, the 6 is a, a much better product for that environment. Okay, thanks, James. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, James. Hello, this is Mark Knoppenberger from Van Tonger in America. I was just curious as to what the difference is between 12L and 12W. Uh, Mark, that's a great, I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. And I appreciate you attending and participating in this. And uh, The difference is the, <laughs> the actual product itself that's in the bag is exactly the same. The difference is the liquid content. So 12L, which is the extreme abrasion resistant, less than three, has a liquid content of 7.6% by weight. The 12W has a liquid content of 10% by weight. Same exact product, 12W provides and is much better suited for like repacking eroded cyclones on the regenerator side where you're wanting to literally pack it in. You're not ramming it. You're just repairing erosion to get it back to full thickness. And it has a C704 erosion loss number of less than five, whereas the 12L is less than three and it's full thickness, one inch or two inch, completely rammed, you know, pressed and rammed into the uh, hex or the, or the other anchoring system that you might be using. Does that explain it for you? That explains it. Um, one other question. 
with the 12L, do you re require ramming or can it be uh, hand packed such as, uh, such as some of the other refractories are with, you know, thumbing it in and, and, and hand packing it? It can yeah, be. Yeah, that, that, that's a great, another great question. We always recommend it, particularly if we're dealing with the anchoring systems, typical in cyclones, that you, you know, thumb it in to get the base established. And ramming would be necessary, uh, if, particularly if we're talking about cyclones, to maximize the erosion resistance. It okay, doesn't mean you can't hand pack it in applications, but typically that's going to be in a situation where we're not needing the erosion of less than three. We're just needing to fill an area. It can still be workable. You can actually tweak the liquid content so that it's applied the way you want it to. But to achieve the maximum erosion resistance, you're going to want to ram it. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great questions, everybody. Now we'll get into some applications. Thank you, yeah, Ted. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss some of these. And, and um, I think the first ones we're going to go into is... Uh, Going to be going to be talking about the cat cracker and okay, I appreciate some of these questions that have been addressed. Um, we have applications in certainly pressure vessels, including sulfur units, all types of heaters and reformers, cracking furnaces like on the ethylene cracking as well as waste gas incineration, boilers, flares, and even sulfur pits and coke pits. So. Our products have been installed in all of these environments, depending upon the need of the client and the requirement uh, to solve a problem or to get them back up online faster. So I just have some pictures here uh, that we're gonna go into. I think this is just a schematic of a cat, which just shows you know, the different aspects of it from the regenerator to the reactor, stripper, transfer lines blue gas line and so forth. So in each one of these areas, the different color schemes are because we're recommending a different type material in the unit, yeah. uh, depending upon the application and what it's gonna be exposed to. So certainly the cyclones are exposed to much more severe erosion than the regenerator wall, as an example. So we're not, we're not going into what specific product we offer, but those can be discussed if anyone is interested uh, furthering this dialogue after the webinar by contacting your local uh, Thermbond rep or uh, James Smith or a specialist or myself. I'd be happy to talk about those things. These are just some pictures that I wanted to include that shows some different applications. This happens to be in a fabrication shop. It's, it's they're being fabricated now. These are regenerator cyclones. You can keep moving, Tom. And they're installing Formula 12L in these uh, pictures. These are just uh, different aspects of the cat cracker being, again, fabricated in a shop. Um, the reference that we say we just prefer Therm Bond, that's up at the top of the screen, was a comment that came from the installers. They really like working with the material. It's easy to install. We work with them. We train them. We had specialists that would work directly with their installation crew to get them familiar with the product because in the past if they had only worked with a competitive material it's a little bit different but it's not difficult by any means and once they're familiar with the technique they prefer it uh, versus the other products that are for the same environment. Just different shapes um, for different units designed by different OEM. So these are, I just wanted to kind of, some of them are very in, intricate, but at least include it as an overview quickly. Some slide valves, these were done internationally, very unique, but specified uh, by the client for Thermbind. And we're gonna move into the, the sulfur recovery unit is an interesting environment. Uh, what I don't want, uh, to be perceived is that the entire unit is lined with Thermbond because this schematic actually might be a little misleading. Uh, we're not recommending Thermbond for the entire unit. 
Uh, we definitely support the use of high density, high aluminum brick, uh, but we have installed Thermbond uh, in repairs for the backup instead of insulating fire brick. Uh, they've used Thermbond, one of our insulating materials, to do a, a turnaround and a repair. We also use Thermbond for the burner tile, our, our 95% alumina, no silica mix, and for the tube sheets. And these are some pictures of tube sheets where we're using, in this case, a ramming 95% alumina therm bond, no silica, uh, high density, erosion resistant, but primarily it's the environment where we're trying to minimize any kind of attack. Uh, we have castables, we have gunnables, and in this case, this is being used for ramming. This is just a process heater floor where we didn't do the whole floor. The client was installing new Lonox burners. So they had to remove the old refractory, install the new burners because they had a different uh, diameter. And then obviously they wanted to get the unit back up and running. There were 16 of these burners installed. And so they installed our medium weight insulating material called 508B uh, to be poured around the new burners and that therefore we brought them up to speed much faster because this was a 15 inch thick floor. The next picture we're going to see is just a, a flare tip which um, sorry Ted it's not there we go there, there it is and this is also rammed very thin but it's not rammed with our uh, high density 12L material. This is a formula 15R. It's about 150 pounds, very similar to the formula 6L because it's a mullite based, but it's a ramming version. So you wouldn't be able to pour castable in this flare tip. So we've developed a ramming version of our 60% alumina mullite based product called 15R with a lot of experience. I think the last installation picture that I've presented here is, it's a sulfur pit where we're gunning a concrete, a Thermbond concrete material during a repair because this material will chemically bond to the existing concrete and eliminate any concerns about lengthy dry out or any concerns with that and it will chemically bond to it. So they're not having to tear it out all the way back and replace all the rebar and put in all new anchors. This is something that we've done multiple times and the concrete chemically bonds to the existing concrete material. The Thermbond concrete chemically bonds. Proven to be very valuable to the client. Okay. All right, I really wanted to get into this, which is the API standard. I've been a part of the API for over 25 years, which is the American Petroleum Institute. I've been on the subcommittee for refractory uh, for since its existence, since it became a subcommittee. And we initiated developing a standard for monolithic materials back in the early 2000s, because we felt it was critical to improve the reliability and the verification of products that are monolithic materials going into refinery high-valued applications. Go ahead, Tom. The focus of this standard is all about quality control. It's a document around 50 pages long. It started out as a refractory practice. They call it an RP. And over time, it became a standard. And uh, uh, hopefully most of you are at least familiar with the document. It's referred to as the API standard 936, but it's all about quality control, installing monolithic refractories, and the process that goes into verifying the material that the client is receiving meets their requirement. Ultimately, it's all about improving reliability and the performance of the materials that are being purchased for, a, for an application. And that's the basis of this standard to improve reliability and performance. We're very proud of it as a committee. 
The document, as I mentioned, being around 50 pages long, has, has a lot of information in it. I would encourage any of you that have never referred to it before or have never uh, read it, that you go to the api.org website and order it because it's a very valuable, useful tool if you deal with refractory monolithic materials. And it doesn't matter whether you're an owner, a contractor, an inspector, or a manufacturer, which is what we are. There's responsibilities of each of these entities defined in the document. I'm only going to address the responsibilities of the manufacturer because I don't have the time to get into all the dynamics. Go ahead, Tom. Well, and Ted, can I just interject here? For, sure. for, those, of, for those of you that are uh, in other industries besides HPI, in my opinion, I think this is a great document that can be applied to other uh, applications in other industries where the owner, the contractor, may not be an inspector involved, but the manufacturer is involved in setting up responsibilities for each party during a refractory installation, and you avoid, <coughs> excuse me, you avoid the finger pointing when there's a, when there's a failure of the refractory after the equipment's been put into operation. So from that standpoint, this to me, this document applies to many, many industries, or at least the practices do. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be nice if they it became a more uh, a more important a refractory standard global industries, right? So, just to address the responsibilities of the manufacturer, there's a lot of confusion that I've been associated with in terms of what is expected of each entity that was previously noted. But the responsibility of the manufacturer is pretty simple. We're required to provide a compliance data sheet. And in a, I think the next slide will actually show an example of one. The data that's being asked, the criteria of the compliance data is all specified within the document. The numbers that your product represents, that's based on your product quality. But the data that's necessary to fill the compliance data is all based on the standard. So that's the responsibility of the manufacturer. It's also the responsibility of the manufacturer to meet that compliance data that you've presented for the client to approve. And in addition to that, the documentation on proper installation techniques and the application instructions, as well as the safety data sheet. So those are the responsibilities of the manufacturer when they're working off of the API standard 936. The next slide here is difficult to read. You don't need to look at what the properties are. That's not the important point here, but the actual data that's necessary is on the right-hand side. This happens to be our formula 12L, but the properties that are required are the liquid content, bulk density, which is the green density, as well as the fire density, and those are in ranges. There's a requirement on cold crush, which is per the ASTM. Permanent linear change, which is from green to dried and dried to fired. And then there's a requirement on erosion, which again is an ASTM standard. The chemical analysis and the shelf life. Those are the properties that are necessary to complete a proper compliance data based on the API standard. The view on the, on the left side is an independent lab that has tested the material, the batch number of the product for pre-qualification. And those are properties that will be presented for the client to review and approve before the material is shipped. So this is part of the pre-qualification requirement based on the API standard with any manufacturer in order to meet compliance, they have to verify the product they're supplying is in, in accordance to their standard. Are there any questions on that particular issue as it relates to testing of the material and the compliance data of the material? Great. Within the document also, there's some important aspects. There's the qualification and the testing of the material is all spelled out. Multiple pages. It covers what test procedures, which I 
briefly discussed the pre-shipment, which is the pre-qualification of the material that's necessary before it's shipped. The qualification of the installation crew and the procedure has to be documented, part of the requirement. Then there's production samples and testing. So there's standards written in as to how many samples have to be tested and pulled while they're installing it in the field and then verified after installation. And then all the test specimen preparation, which is required by the, the laboratory, are all spelled out in the document. So it's a really <coughs> well written procedure so that everybody is on the same page and they all understand what's expected because the procedures are documented and verified. There's also some very important aspects that the document continues to go into, which I am not covering in detail here, but it's all detailed out in, that, in the standard, which refers to the installation and the execution of the project. And that's the responsibility of the contractor, just as a reference. There's a, all a, an overview of how repair procedures should be completed and done properly. And then there's a section on curing and dry out. I'm going to address the curing and the dry out portion during this discussion because that's one of the aspects where we differentiate Thermbond versus the conventional uh, water-based products. So within the dry out, the procedure, the contractor has to develop that procedure. And that's going to be based on the material, the operating temperature, the thickness, the anchoring, all of those will defer what that procedure will be because it can be different depending upon the thickness, the operating temperature, and the lining com uh, composition. The schedule itself, the whole focus of the dry out is to remove the retained moisture from within the refractory without adversely affecting the structure or the mechanical properties. And there's an index page which every supplier can give the client what the dry out index would be based on the lining design. The index in the document is based on a specific thickness at a specific operating temperature, but that only gives a relevant number because each application can be different. So as an example, a client could receive an index from supplier A and the index is a number, 30. Let's just say that. It's 30 hours to do the dry out. A client could get the same lining thickness from a different vendor, let's say Thermbond, and the number is 10. So that means 10 hours versus 30 hours, and then the client can determine whether or not that value is what they need for their specific requirement. And that's just a process within the document that is part of the procedure to review and evaluate based on the opportunity. Here's the last thing that I'm going to go into in much detail because we're running out of time, but it covers, and I'm getting close to the end, it's perfect. API certification for refractory personnel. So misunderstood as far as people that I've communicated with. And I'm open for questions. I can open those questions now or I can open it after I talk briefly. But I think it's very important to understand there's two different certification requirements. Having an API 936 certification is strictly a matter of understanding the document and other relevant body of knowledge information that could be coming from uh, the plant, the unit, uh, concrete, uh, API concrete structures, and the applicant would take an examination, a written exam, in order to obtain this certification. That certification is a practitioner's certification. It has nothing to do with being certified as a refractory inspector, and that can be misunderstood. So any end user that someone walks in saying that they're a refractory inspector 
and all they have ever done is taken a written exam on the API 936 standard, that does not qualify them as a refractory inspector. A refractory inspector must also demonstrate minimum competencies in inspection activities specific to the job that they're being asked to inspect. And the details, the requirements, the years of service, the number of, of references are all spelled out in the document. And in addition, they must also take that written exam, but that written exam is literally just so that they understand the body of knowledge and the information that's pertained in that 50 page standard of the 936. So I wanted to make sure that that was at least addressed and discussed because the question has been brought to my attention multiple times. And if anyone has a question regarding that, please feel free to ask. Uh, hi, Ted Arindam here. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two questions. One is related to your previous uh, section of uh, slide 28 and I'm one about 39. So I will start with the 28. Okay. It's a schematic diagram of uh, SRUs. Yeah. In SRUs, normally uh, the most affected equipments are the thermal oxidizers and the reaction furnaces, which are primarily lined with bricks. Right. In, 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 in uh, shutdowns, we very commonly come across few bricks falling off. Now, this brick manufacturing takes a long time. It's not normally in stock. So yep. my question is that in such situations, uh, a product like 18L or 18BL of uh, uh, thumb bond will, can be applied normally in reaction furnace is 95% alumina. Yep. So what's the question? Uh, the question is, in, if some bricks like that falls out, uh, do you recommend that we make bricks uh, mold out and we place it? Okay. Out uh, of we, thumb bond? Yeah, uh, random. that's an excellent question. I would say this. If it's a situation where you are unable, and we've done this multiple times, where we have supplied Formula 18 series material, Typically it's 18R because it can be hand packed or rammed. But what we have done is repairs where you can't get the brick. It's, we have very limited options, but we're not saying that that repair is gonna give you five years life. What, what we can have confidence in because we've done it is it will extend the life of what you have until you are able to get the proper brick for a long-term replacement. So it's been done. We've done it at multiple facilities, but we don't want to give the indication that that repair is going to provide the same long-term integrity of what the brick can offer. And one of the reasons is the creep resistance of brick is much better than the creep resistance of our monolithic Formula 18 series. So it's just, it's one of those things where we have to make sure we talk about it, evaluate the value that it can provide based on the specifics of that particular concern. Does that help you? Oh, that answers my question. Thanks, it's a great answer. Uh, uh, the next is about uh, this API uh, 936, slide number 39. Yes. Yes, here uh, I have a, uh, if we go through API 936 standards, they specify certain things as ambient temperature, temperature of the mix, uh, and these are pretty low. Uh, I would say for a conventional customer, uh, the API 936 refers to a mixed temperature of 25. I have personally used 18, 18 uh, R where in instantly after the mix, I have checked the temperature is 43 to 50 degrees centigrade by the time I transfer it. Sure. So, so how relevant is this API 936 standard with respect to Thermbond as a special product? It's not a sure. conversion. Again, this is such a great, a great question because it applies here as well as in, in other areas of the document. This document, the standard 936, is all written around conventional refractory. So everything that's written in there is based on conventional material. When we present Thermbond, we're presenting it as an alternative. 
there are going to be differences because when you mix therm bond, it generates its own heat, which is the exothermic reaction. So depending upon the location, where is the job being installed? Is it in Canada in the middle of winter or is it in Houston, Texas in the middle of the summer? We would make different recommendations to prepare the material such as putting it in literally freezers if it's in the middle of Houston and, and it's 100 degrees outside. So okay. prior to mixing, and I mean that just so that we would cool everything down so that that exothermic reaction doesn't make it difficult to install. Each one of those situations would have to be discussed up front and hopefully uh, addressing the concerns and recognizing what would be necessary for a successful job. Right, thank you. I hope that helps. Thank you. So what we've covered here, just to summarize, what we've covered is we talked about the unique liquid phosphate bond, <clears throat> the industry-wide acceptance worldwide and how we've grown from our uh, infant days back in the mid 90s. Applications from pressure vessels to stacks to sulfur pits, and then trying to help an overview of understanding the value and the importance of the API standard 936 as a quality control document. I hope that everybody who's attended uh, found the time valuable. I really appreciate the input and the questions that were asked. And certainly uh, any further questions or you'd, you're interested in getting more substantive details of some of the testing that we've done over the many years, like the verification of the bond, chemical bond strength and things. I didn't have time to go into those today, but don't hesitate to reach out and ask if we could support what was presented because you're interested in more information and we'll be happy to follow that up with you. So I appreciate everybody's participation uh, and your time.